I'm going to share my video up and I will share my screen with you. I'll just minimize this. So hopefully you all see my screen now. If anyone you can't, please let me know. Otherwise, I will assume you can see it. So as I said, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, climate change, essentially. Um, the science and politics and a general overview of what it means and what we can do about it. So we're going to go through quite a lot here. And we're going to start with a basic introduction, firstly to me and secondly to climate. Then we're going to talk about the greenhouse effect. And then we're going to look at past, present and future climate change. Before ending on the more social science side of things, such as the adaptation, the mitigation ideas, the politics, um, and lastly, ending on what we can all do about it. What you're going to hear today is a highly compressed version of a course that I teach, firstly at the University of Oxford, and secondly as a private tutor, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about at the end. So as I said, I am a research fellow um, at the University of Bristol at Reading. I belong to several groups that you can see there. And my main primary research interest is in past climate, which we usually call paleoclimate. When I say past, I don't mean the so-called historical era, so the last sort of 2,000, 3,000 years, when we have historical documents. I mean the geological past. We usually call it deep time. So this can range from tens of thousands of years ago all the way up to millions, if not billions of years ago. And the question is, why do I want to do that? And we will talk a little bit more about that later. But for now, I'll just leave you with this slide that shows you some of these periods during the deep time. So the mid Holocene, for example, is 6,000 years ago, all the way down to the early Eocene, 55 million years ago. And you have other research interests. So one of my PhD students is looking at African rainfall. Um, I have another student looking at uh, perceptions of climate change and how the media uh, respond to it. So, often people ask me, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? And what I always say is, other than looking at the BBC News like you do, I have no idea. I don't really do weather. The official definitions are here. I won't read these out because you can all read this perfectly well. But very simply, meteorology is the study of weather. Not to be confused with the study of meteors or the science of measurement. In contrast, climatology is the study of average weather. And what that means is it's average in both time and space. So an example of average in space, we all know, for example, that South East England here is on average warmer than Scotland. An example of average in time, we all know that on average in Reading, July is warmer than January. So the idea is, and it's been completely summarized by a colleague of mine, climate is what we expect, weather is what we get. Another comment I often get is climate has always changed, what's it got to do with us? Part of that sentence is correct. You have to differentiate between natural climate change, which you can see a reference to the top here, and anthropogenic, or more simply, human induced climate change. We sometimes call this global warming, although they are not actually synonymous, because global warming refers to the increase in temperatures alone, whereas climate change involves the whole um, Earth system, so things like sea level rise, rainfall, etc. So while it is absolutely true that climate has always changed naturally, we know this because of these images here. So for example, that middle image is a U-shaped valley. 
that was carved out by a massive glacier that would have moved through that valley, carving out the land, which has obviously melted uh, in the present day. Likewise, volcanoes on the right here, we know that they have a huge impact on climate. The uh, year of no summer in 1816 was in part caused by the Mount Pinatubo volcano uh, that went off a couple of years earlier. So yes, it is true that climate has always changed. But here's the important thing. It is the speed of the change which we can directly attribute to human activities that is totally unprecedented. You'll hear me talk a little bit about the IPCC, which is the main body overseeing scientific research on climate change, which we all feed into, which uh, writes a big report every five years. So, starting with the greenhouse effect. If we consider a black body, which is a hypothetical uh, construct in which all energy absorbed is equal to all energy emitted. If we do that, we create what's called the Goldilocks zone, i.e. the planet, our planet, is near enough to the sun, not too cold, not too hot. However, if the Earth were a black body, it would be outside the habitable zone. In fact, our global average temperature would be about min minus 18 degrees, which, as you know, would mean there would be no liquid water anywhere on the surface. As it happens, our planet globally average temperature is about plus 15 degrees. So there must be another factor influencing it. What is that factor? Well, the spoiler alert is in the title. The greenhouse effect is essentially made up of greenhouse gases. You can see various definitions of the gases at the greenhouse effect here, but very simply, it is a thick layer of gas that surrounds our planet and acts a little bit like a blanket. So without this layer of gas, solar radiation would hit the Earth, it would warm the Earth a bit, and it would be reflected back into space. With the gases, some of it, some of that emitted energy back into space is redirected back into and back into the planet, which warms it. So the most abundant and powerful natural greenhouse gas is H2O, water vapor. But the most powerful human induced greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide. And the reason that's important is because unlike water vapor, CO2 is very long lived. It hangs around for hundreds of thousands of years. So move on to past climates. And again, when I say past, I don't mean the last few hundred years, I mean genetical past. But essentially, in the early 1800s, um, geology was all the rage, very trendy. In 1860 and 1870, James Crowell, who you can see here on the right, was the first to think about how the Earth's orbit around the sun might change uh, over time. And what he realised is that firstly, our orbit changes around the sun and the orbit of the moon changes. He realised that our orbit is actually elliptical, not circular, and that this varies with time. He realised there was a tilt in our pole of rotation and that there was a wobble. But it wasn't until 1913 that Milankovic refined these theories and eventually came up with today's modern theory, and he introduced three new terms, eccentricity, obliquity, and precession. So the first one, eccentricity, is how much the Earth's orbit varies around the Sun, and this changes from being fairly circular, you can see here, to fairly elliptical, you can see here, on a period of about somewhere between 100 and 400,000 years. Obliquity is the tilt of the Earth's axis, and that changes about 41,000 year interval, and there is a wobble. The best way I can show you is to do this. What this does is it causes our seasons and seasonal cycles to change. So we have a warmer 
uh, winter in the so, well, warmer summer in the northern hemisphere and the warmer winter in the southern hemisphere. The main driver of long term change, by which I mean billions of years, is obviously the sun. Other factors, such as greenhouse effects, came in pretty soon after, but the sun is the main long term driver. We know, for example, that a massive drop in the sun's output over millions and millions of years caused a snowball earth when we had ice everywhere, after which we had what's called the Cambrian explosion, where essentially life as we know started on this planet. So why study these long distant periods? Well, firstly, it is to test our models, which I'll talk a bit about later. But secondly, it's because some of these periods might provide analogies of a future climate. So, for example, three million years ago, we were roughly at where we are in terms of CO2 now, roughly 400 parts per million. At that time, global temperatures were about three to six degrees higher than they are today. Obviously, it took a long time to get that level of, of, of warming, millions of years, in fact. But it could be analogous to today. In contrast, the Eocene, 55 million years ago, had CO2 levels roughly double or more than today, which is what we think might be the worst case scenario by 2100. So studying the Eocene might give us at least a glimpse of what we have to come. Now today, um, and in that context, our orbit is less eccentric than average. It's about average in terms of tilt, and we have our summer in the Northern Hemisphere. But because our orbit is not very eccentric, it doesn't really matter. And people often ask me, are we in the middle of an ice age? And the technical question to answer is yes and no. People often refer to the last ice age as ending about 12,000 years ago. That's when all of our movies like uh, Ice Age are set with the woolly mammoths, etc. But actually, an ice age is defined by whenever there is permanent all year round ice. And we know that there is now. We have Antarctica and Arctic that exist all year. But within these long cycles, there are also shorter lived cycles called stadials. And think of these like a kind of pulse or cold or warm spell. So, for example, if you have a stadial during a glacial, that is a cold spell during a cold period, i.e., very, very cold, and so on. Today, Although we are technically in an ice age, it's often not referred to as an ice age because we are in a cold spell during a warmer period. Hence, we have the presence of permanent ice age, so we are technically in an ice age, but it's not like it was back in the sort of media driven ice age. So, it's well known now that the, as you increase the greenhouse gases, especially CO2, um, they warm the planet and other, at the same time, other particles such as aerosols uh, cool the planet. And obviously, if you have more energy coming into the planet than you do going out, Earth will warm. And currently, the Earth is warming at a remarkable 250 billion electric heaters across the globe. We know this because we have our instrumental records combined with our proxy data, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the instrumental record goes back to about 1850. We have a combination of Stevenson screens, where you measure the air temperature above the ground. We have um, ship measurements from both boys. And we have satellite data from about 1979. And as you can see from this figure on the right, where the black line is from the Met Office and the red and blue are from two other institutions in America, we see a rapid and fairly obvious warming from about 1900 onwards. If you superimpose that last figure onto this figure, which goes back a thousand years, what you can see is it's quite 
it's remarkable. So the blue line shows you our proxy data. So this is made up from various things like tree rings, uh, ice cores, and other pollen uh, data, which we can carbon date back to when they were around, and then determine what the temperature was at that time. The black line is the average through the blue line, and the red line is the instrumental period, so 1850 onwards. And what you can see here, very obviously, is there has been a massive, massive rise from about 1900, 1950 onwards, which is unprecedented in the last thousand years, and it turns out unprecedented beyond that even more. In terms of our models, which I will talk about shortly, these are two figures showing climate simulations. So climate models, which are basically large computer programs projecting the climate from 1900 up to the year 2000. Focusing on the top figure first, the black line shows our observations, the same that we saw in the last slide. The blue line shows the models when, this is important, when they are forced only with natural factors. So the only thing these models know is volcanic eruptions and the sun. So the thin blue line show each individual model as the thick blue line shows the average. And what you can clearly see is that from around 1950 onwards, the, the model, the blue, does not match the black. The black goes up and up and up, the blue sort of stays stable. It is only in the bottom figure when you add in the effect of CO2 and other human factors, does the model suddenly match the data and actually matches it with remarkable um, accuracy. This brings me nicely on to climate modeling. And basically, the idea here is if you want to understand the climate, you need, or rather, if you want to understand how the climate is changing, you need to understand the climate system in the first place. To do this, we break it down into five major components. The atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, the land surface, and the biosphere which obviously includes us. The top left-hand figure is a simplified version of our planet. The bottom figure is an even more simplified version of that. And it's the bottom figure that our model uses to, uh, to, to make our predictions. So for example, for each component, we need to build a mathematical model of it. So in the atmosphere, for example, we need to calculate the way it circulates, the processes that go in and out of it, and the passage of radiation, either from the sun or back from the earth, and so on for all the other components. So what is a model? Well, on the right-hand side, that is a model, but it's not the one we are talking about. A model can be extremely simple, such as one line, such as that figure on the right in the middle, which is a straight linear regression, or extremely complex. My favourite rumour, which is probably not true, is that if you took the model that I use all the time from the Met Office and you wrote it down, it would fill 30 encyclopedias. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's a nice fact. And climate model is often known as a GCM, a general circulation, or sometimes a global climate model. And what we do is we break the world down into three dimensional grid boxes. And at each grid box, at each boundary, we perform multiple equations to calculate the movement of energy, the conservation of momentum, etc., etc., in all dimensions so up, down, left, right, back, and forward. The outcome of these models is obviously our future projections. And what we do is we have scenarios that are called RCPs, Radiation Concentration Pathways. They're a bit different from simple temperature-based scenarios because they take into account all elements of the climate system, such as uh, sea level rise. So the example one 
is what we call the RCP 4.5. It's roughly equivalent to a two degree temperature rise. And it's usually considered a business as usual scenario. That is the green light and the top figure. Again, the paler light shows each individual model, the cutter light shows the average of all models. In contrast, RCP 8.5, which is the purple light, is roughly equivalent to a four degree warming or more. And it's usually considered the worst case scenario, but being a bit pessimistic, that might be the trajectory that we are on. Now, it's important to note that the temperature increases will not be globally constant. Uh, we think we are fairly confident that um, there will be more warming over land, and especially in the polar regions. Um, and uh, sea level rise is, sorry, and the temperatures are expected to rise a bit faster over ocean regions. If we go down to the more regional scale, such as the UK, this figure here on the top shows you black is our observations and red is our model predictions um, under a medium high scenario. And as you can see from the little black um, star around the year 2000, in 2003, you may remember we had a record heat wave. It's actually been surpassed the last two years, but then it was record. There were loads of deaths all across Europe. And as you can see at the time, it was a lot warmer than either the normal situation, which is the rest of the black line, or a lot warmer than the model suggested. But what you can also see, hopefully, is that by the 2040s, that type of summer would be very, very average. And by the 2060s, it would be an extremely cold summer. Now, I should say here that when we are making predictions, we are not um, predicting an actual event. No model can say 2025 will be a record-breaking year. All we are doing is we are predicting trends, trends and patterns, where we think that the actual event, when we get to it, will either fall into that trend or it won't. It's not all about temperature, though. There are other impacts of future climate change. And one of those is our rainfall. Rainfall, unlike temperature, is much, much harder to predict. Although we understand well the large scale patterns in rainfall, when it comes to a country scale or even a river catchment scale, our uncertainty is much greater. Likewise, Arctic sea ice, um, the, the um, September extent, which is where we usually measure it, is predicted to reduce over this century by 94%. So our observations on the top right hand side there shows the average over the last 30 years and the right hand side shows a complete disappearance of sea ice altogether. And the same principle is true on land ice. Now obviously Arctic sea ice melting won't contribute to sea level rise, but land ice will, in particular the shrinking glaciers in Greenland and New Zealand and Antarctica. Sea of a rise, you can see here, is predicted to be anywhere between uh, 0.6 and uh, 1 meter. So the IPCC that I talked about puts it as 26 to 82 centimeter rise by the end of the century, most of which is thermal expansion. So it's not actually the melting glaciers that are contributing to the most sea of a rise, it's thermal expansion. We all know that when you boil a kettle, the water expands. Right, so uncertainties. There's a nice analogy here that uh, Donald Rumsfeld um, said many years ago. And he talked about known knowns and known unknowns, and the worst case is unknown unknowns, i.e. we don't yet know what we don't yet know. And one of our biggest uncertainties, which are unknown unknowns, are feedback loops. You could call these vicious circles. We understand how these work under our current situation, but we don't understand how they might change in the future. So one example here is a positive uh, feedback loop, 
which is water vapor on the left hand side. The idea is that temperature goes up, causes more water vapor. As I told you, water vapor is a very strong greenhouse gas, so that would increase the greenhouse effect, cause more warming, that would cause more water vapor, that would cause a strong greenhouse effect around you, around you, around you. The same is true for the ice albedo. So we know that ice as a white surface reflects energy. So as the temperature goes up, you have more melting, which means you have less of a white area, which means you have more warming. Temperature goes up again, and round and round you, you go. And feedback loops can be either positive, i.e. enhancing, or negative, i.e. they dampen the original effect. And to make it even worse, they can often be the same. They, they can be positive and negative at the same time. So one example is at the bottom of the uh, um, screen here, where we have what's called the plant fertilization effect. What that means is, as the temperature goes up because of CO2, you have more plants and, plants and trees, because plants and trees like more CO2. As you have more plants and trees, they absorb more CO2, and they cause the temperature to go down. But what happens to the temperature then? Because if you also have more plants and trees, you have a darker surface, which causes temperature to go up. So we have no idea whether the temperature decrease due to the CO2 absorption by more trees will counterbalance the increase of CO2. And we don't know which feedback will dominate. So moving on now to adaptation versus mitigation. The key difference between these two is that adaptation implies that the event either has happened or is going to happen and it tries to reduce the impact of that event. Mitigation tries to stop the event happening before it occurs. And you can see two official definitions here. So you might say, why adapt? Well, this figure here, which I showed you just now, even if we went down the lowest RCP, 2.6, the sort of blue line, which by the way is now impossible, because that would have meant CO2 emissions going down to zero about five years ago. So we haven't done that now. But even if we did, you can see we are committed to at least a one degree temperature rise, if not more. Therefore, because of the lag in the climate system, even if we stopped emissions altogether tomorrow, and we're not going to, let's be honest, we are still committed to probably at least 1.5 to 2 degrees. So what would that mean? Well, in the UK, you can see on the top right here, summer and winter for the UK, the first two panels show temperature, the second two panels show rainfall. In the temperature panels, red is warmer than today, and in the rainfall, blue is wetter than today. So we know that UK winters will be warmer, so we won't need so much central heating, which is a good thing. However, we know that summers in the UK will be a lot warmer, so we might need cooling. How many buildings have air conditioning right now? I certainly don't. The questions arise such as, can our buildings even be adapted to have air conditioning? Um, what about the energy needed to run the units, and do we have an infrastructure that is able to deal with these higher temperatures? We already have seen in the last few years that whenever it gets too hot in the summer, the uh, national rail breaks down. So that could be an increasing problem. In terms of rainfall, in general, our winters will be a lot wetter, which will obviously result in flooding if, if it's not properly managed. In the summer, we see a different pattern, more of a north-south divide, so drier in the north and wetter across central England. So will we need to start storing water? Will we be able to transfer water from the south, relatively wet south, to the dry north? These are all questions that nobody has the answers to yet. And of course, there are other extreme events, such as flooding, windstorms, 
grabbed out of wildfires. So the question is that we simply don't know how to answer yet. In terms of mitigation, there are two types. The first type is to reduce the amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases, and that arguably is the most important. But the second type is the idea of geoengineering. And the idea here is to somehow reduce the global temperature by artificial means. So one example on the right here, this is, this is an artist's interpretation. The idea would be to increase the cloud albedo, i.e. spray water from the ocean really high into the stratosphere, which is higher up in the atmosphere, where the salt would cause droplets to condense. You would have more clouds that would then reflect more of the sun's energy back into space. And the other example is what we call CCS, carbon capture and storage. And the idea here, which I would argue is a far better idea than the first example, is to literally take the carbon out of the emissions at source. So what you do is you fit essentially a large filter to your power station, which captures up to 90% of the uh, CO2. But the question now, which I've, I'm quite interested in, is not really can we do it, because the answer is yes. We have the, we have the technology to do these things. So rather, should we do it? And the problem here is that it's a moral dilemma. Does it, for example, reduce your incentive for cutting CO2, which is the, uh, which is the main problem? Is it reversible, for example? If you create a load more clouds to reflect a load more radiation, supposing you go too far, how do you know when to stop? Might there be unknown side effects, for example? And also, is it politically sensitive? For example, Russia would quite like a much warmer climate because they have a vast area in their northern high latitudes where if it were warmer, they could use that for agriculture. On the other hand, countries across, across Africa really don't want it to get warmer. So the question would be, if you were to do these things, firstly, who would be in charge? Secondly, who would press the start button? And also, who would press the stop button? So it's a very murky area, morally and ethically. So we're coming to the end, and moving on to the politics. So, although we knew about climate change, um, many years ago, it didn't really become political until 1992, where it all started in the Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit. And what this created was the UNFCCC, the UN Framework on Climate Change. And what we have, or have had ever since then, is a conference of the parties, COP, whereby all the party nations um, meet together once a year, or mostly, mostly once a year, um, to review each country's uh, attempts to tackle this, this problem. So one of the big events was in 1997, where we had the Kyoto Protocol ratified. And at that point, um, 37 countries had binding commitments, but only seven have since ratified. You will probably know about the Paris Agreement, which was five years ago. It was due to enter force this year, and it was considered a major, major breakthrough, a major success. It was the first ever legally binding global climate deal. And loads of countries, loads of countries signed it. And the key result was to limit global warming to under two degrees by the year 2100. So we move on to the UK example, because obviously you, you will know that some countries such as the US pulled out of the Paris Agreement, and we are still waiting to see what will happen. So we go to the UK now. Um, this is a statement that Amber Rudd made in back in five years ago. And actually, the UK, compared to some countries, is not doing too badly. If we look at these two figures at the bottom, dated from May 2016, we can see that for the first time, coal-fired electricity 
went down to zero for a few days at May. And for the first time on the right hand side, solar power dominated and um, coal fired uh, power. So we are doing well, but we do have a long way to go. So I realize that what I've just said is probably a bit depressing. Um, there's a lot of uncertainties, a lot of bad news out there. But I want to end with a, a level of optimism and talk about individual responsibility. What can we all do on a personal level? It turns out the answer is quite a lot. Now I must say I'm not preaching here. I'm not telling you to do these things. These are just ideas. It's up to you whether you do any or all of them. Some people won't be able to do some of them. Some people can do some of them. Everybody can do a little bit. The first one is fairly obvious. Try to reduce our carbon footprint by travel. So try to cut down on your personal vehicle. Try to cycle or walk to work. And most importantly, reduce your use of aviation. The second one is try to reduce your carbon footprint at home. Um, an easy one to do is to switch to a renewable energy supplier. Obviously, some of these are a bit more expensive, such as installing solar panels, so not everybody will be able to do all of these, as I said. Um, but they are possibilities. Um, this one you might not know about. Some institutions are better than others when it comes to investing in fossil fuels. Some banks, for example, invest heavily in fossil fuels. And likewise, some supermarkets are a lot better than others. Obviously, I'm not allowed to say which ones, but it is all available online. It is all very easily researchable. And so it is worth thinking about. Number four is food and recycling. Now, this is obviously slightly indirectly related to climate change, because, for example, re re recycling is and not going to directly contribute to reducing CO2, but because the Earth system is all interrelated, it does all have an impact. So, for example, um, buying organic reduces our amount of fertilizers going into the river system, which then run off into the sea. Diet. Now, this is a controversial one. I'm not going to tell anybody that you have to become vegetarian or vegan. I myself am not vegetarian. I have cut down massively, but I do eat meat and fish. But we all know it's very clear, the evidence is very obvious that um, cattle production and meat production is very, very bad for the climate. Starting at the uh, rearing stage right through to the actual production stage. So reducing your meat, especially beef and lamb, is... Um, a good thing to do. Now, there was a big report that came out last year called the Planetary Health Diet, which, uh, for those of us who like our meat, was pretty uh, bleak reading. So, for example, in order to be totally carbon friendly, you should only eat one quarter of a sausage per week. That's obviously uh, not going to happen uh, for most people, um, but that was a global assessment. It turns out that regionally we're doing a bit better. Here in the UK, for example, we've worked out that if you cut out meat one day a week, that would have a huge impact on our, on our UK production and therefore on the climate system. And lastly, it is collective action. Now, the argument that it's all too big for me, it doesn't matter what I do, etc. is not really valid because that's the same argument for voting. You could say it doesn't matter who I vote for, it's all irrelevant. Actually, personal action is necessary, but it won't do on its own. No one individual, in fact no one country, will solve the issue of human-induced climate change and its effects. It needs to be a collective a, 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 a collective group. It's a bit like COVID. Climate change has no borders, so everybody has to be involved. So one thing that we can do as individuals 
is to join a group, either locally, such as the Reddit uh, Network, or Extinction Rebellion. It doesn't mean, if you join XR, for example, that you have to uh, partake in civil disobedience. I am a member of XR, but I'm not about to superglue myself to a bus. So it is important to get together and to form groups that, when they are formed, will put pressure on individual governments to act, act and do something about it. The last point to make, and I think the most important point to make, is to talk about climate change. There's a great quote from one of the uh, UN ambassadors that says, each one teach one. And that is in many ways what I'm trying to do today, to allow you to firstly want to talk about climate change, but secondly to be able to talk a bit more knowledgeably about climate change. I'm not suggesting that you need to know everything about it, and often, often if you're talking to somebody who is a bit sceptical, then showing them facts and figures won't help, it'll just take them in further. But if you can address uh, the issue from a shared perspective, and this was really uh, brought home by a colleague of mine, Catherine Hayhoe, who is a professor in, uh, in the States, what she says is that Sometimes, rather than talking about climate change and going straight into the, into the numbers and CO2 and all that, it's a lot better to start with a shared value. It might be care about your children and their future. It might be a love of being outside in nature. It might be a faith group. It might be any sort of thing. But if you start from a locally uh, a shared, um, shared circuit point, and then you'll end up talking about climate change without even realising it. So, another thing to talk about is the idea of the carrot versus the stick. And I think this is very important because we all know that if you try to make somebody do something, and by doing it they will be somehow hurt, either financially or socially or whatever, it's a worse way than having an incentive. So here are four of the um, things that I talked about in the last slide. If we look at all the benefits to all of these, it starts to become a no-brainer. So if you reduce um, travel, you get improved air quality. We all know that cycling and walking improves both your physical and mental health. Likewise, at home, once you get over the official uh, initial financial layout, it is actually cheaper in the long run. And the benefits of the foods and recycling and diet points are very obvious. I mean, if we uh, source our products locally, we firstly support our local farmers, but secondly, we cut down on the carbon footprint of um, shipping our food in from another part of the world. If we cut down our food waste, we save money. If we uh, switch to more of a plant-based diet is much healthier. We all know there are health risks associated with a large amount of red meat. So the idea of body health equals planetary health is quite important. Final word of caution. So as we all know, the idea of human-induced climate change and what to do about it has become very trendy over the last well, few years now. Primarily thanks to the school strikes that Greta Thunberg started, and also due to protest movements such as XR in this country and elsewhere. However, this is very important, there have also been some very extreme claims made by some groups. So, billions will die. Life on Earth is dying. The world is going to end in 12 years. As far as I am aware, there is no scientific study to back up any of these statements. Yes, climate change is a massive problem. Yes, it will be incredibly difficult for a huge amount of people. But we're not talking about an apocalyptic event. So, you know, there's a new concern now, which has been coined eco-anxiety. 
apparently, I'm, I'm not an expert here, but it is quite prevalent in children, especially following the school strikes. And research is underway now to investigate this, to find out how much we think it really is. But we do know, for example, that there are mental health problems such as PTSD associated with those that have been caught up in a, in a natural disaster. And the new phrase, climate extremism. Obviously, with any uh, protest group, there will be those that are more extreme than others. Unfortunately, they tend to have the louder voices. So I would just caution everybody that when you read stuff in the media or on social media, don't believe absolutely everything you read because as well as reading stuff like climate deniers who say it's not a problem, you might also read the other end of the spectrum by people that say oh, we're going to die in 10 years' time. So I will end there. You can contact me by email, these two addresses, or you can follow me on Twitter. As I said, this uh, course, um, this today, is a very shortened version of a course that I teach. Now I teach it once a year at the University of Oxford. It is uh, 10 weeks long, two hours per week, usually with a group of about 15 or 20. I do also, however, teach it as a completely private tuition service. And you can see the website here. And this can be personalised to suit you. So if you, for example, only care about the political side of climate change, we can dump all the hard science and just focus on the politics. So if you're interested, check it out. And I'll be asked to end on this slide which advertises the Reading Climate Action Network. Um, so give them a follow as well. So I will stop sharing and ask if you would like any questions. There are several points in the chat. Ask me to share the slides, which I which I, I will do. Um, the slides will be available at some point, and as I said, this uh, this, this recording will be. Um, I'm not sure where it's going yet. It's um, it might be on YouTube or it might be part of the um, Reading Culture Live website, but it will be available at some point. Any other questions? Or rather, any questions? Oh yes, Tracy has just said um, that the uh, recording will be hosted on the Reading Culture Live website as an on-demand event after the festival is over. I know it's a lot to take in. Um, it was quite uh, fast moving, but any questions on any aspect that I can answer. As I said, if you want to ask a question, you can either turn your video on and just wave at me, um, or raise your hand using the raise hand button. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Andrew. Um, could you explain what the albedo is? Yes, of course. Um, so the albedo effect is um, the amount of radiation, solar radiation, that is um, reflected by a surface. So a paler surface, such as a white surface over ice, will reflect a lot more radiation than a darker surface, such as a forest. So one, um, one example that has been suggested, particularly in large cities, is that they paint all of their tower blocks white on top. Now, although this might not have a very big impact globally, it does have quite a big impact locally. So as we know, cities themselves are usually warmer than the surrounding, uh, surrounding countryside. So if you can do anything to reduce a city's temperature, then painting the buildings white might be, might be an idea. 
Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Another question on the chat. So, somebody asked, can I ask if there is any way that you can recommend for a good source of accurate and accessible climate information? Um, well, the best place is actually the IPCC website. If you just Google IPCC, as I said, they write a report every five years um, um, for as a sort of overview of the, all the science. So every five years, we um, we submit our papers to them. They condense everything into three big volumes. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting you read that, but there is a really useful summary. And the summary is written for the lay public. It's called the Summary for Policymakers. So if you start with that, it's only a few pages long. Um, it will tell you all the most up-to-date science, which basically all scientists agree on. Does that answer your question? We have another question here. Um, what is the best way to deal with, with people who don't believe it? That's a very good question. Uh, there are a lot of people who don't believe it, or rather, that they might believe that climate change is real, but they don't believe that we are we are to blame. Um, as I said, in my talk, the best way is to just talk to these people from a sort of um, friendly and um, calm manner. Don't try and force them with facts and figures, because you will cause them to dig in even deeper. Um, I, I mean, you might think that sounds a bit wishy-washy. I'm not telling you to hold hands and sing uh, here in the world, but if you just address people with consideration and with um, discussing the various topics. Uh, as I said, sometimes don't even use the word climate change. Start from something that you do agree on, such as, I think everybody would agree that better air quality is good for all of us. If you start from that perspective, you'll find that by joining the dots, you will end up talking about climate change. So, another question, uh, what are the arguments that they use, skeptics use, to argue that climate change isn't caused by humans? Um, well, yes, there are several arguments they use. Um, firstly, the most obvious argument is they say that uh, it, it's all natural, that we are just part of a natural cycle of changing. It, well, that's not actually true. Because if you look, if you were to look at the, there's a figure I showed to you a while ago, if you look at the data, the proxy data going back in time, and it was all natural, we should be getting colder right now. If you look at the data for the last six to nine thousand years, our maximum warming was about six thousand years ago, and we've been getting colder ever since. Until that is 200 years ago, when suddenly uh, it it it, it, it rocketed. The other argument they sometimes use is that it's all down to the sun. Again, we know that's not true because the sun has actually, over the last 50 to 100 years, to become a slightly weaker, ever so slightly, which again means we should be getting colder. So those are two two two, two examples. Um, what other question? Somebody says it may be that it's important chicken is worse than beef or lamb uh, because they are fed on products of rainforest destruction. Yes, I mean, in terms of actual looking after the animals and how you rear them, that could be true. But in terms of actual CO2 production, um, beef and lamb um, are still the, the number one and that number two in terms of uh, CO2. Um, somebody asked, do I have any recommendations for documentaries on this subject? Um, well, the obvious answer is everything that David Attenborough has ever done. Um, in particular, his most recent movie, uh, which is on Netflix, called... Um, what is it called? I can't remember. But either way, he talks about um, the ecological crisis and, and 
his life during it. Um, there's also a very good podcast available on the BBC that's called uh, What Planet Do We Live On? where they interview a number of, of, of experts um, talking about various different aspects of, of climate change, including food. Um, so that, that's um, yeah, two, two options to start. Um, another question. My view on nuclear energy. Yes, that's a difficult one. I mean, obviously, it is greener than coal or gas. No doubt about that. In terms of climate emissions, um, it is uh, an improvement, but obviously there are a lot of other risks to it. Uh, not least, of course, health and um, expense to build one. Um, I don't think it is the answer to getting us out of the climate uh, crisis that we're in. Um, I, I don't think you could build enough of them to significantly outweigh the coal the coal stations. Um, does that answer your question? I hope so. Oh yeah, somebody just told me that the David Attenborough is called a life in our planet. So yes, look it up, check it out. So we're probably gonna have to end pretty soon because it's two minutes two. Um and there is another meeting at seven that you might be wanting to go to. So we've got time for one more question if Anybody wants to ask one more, one more question? Okay, well, I think that's probably it. Um, as I said, this recording will be available um, on the on the Radio Live website, um, and I may put it on my YouTube channel. Um, I may not because some of the figures are potentially covered by copyright, so. Whether I can publish them under my name is is it is questionable, but it will certainly be available at some point. Um, and check out the resident website um, uh, as and when after the festival. So thanks a lot, everybody. I'm going to end the meeting now. Thank you for coming. Stay well, stay safe, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you do have any other questions, um, in the meantime, you can always. Find me on Twitter and get hold of me uh, from there. So bye for now. Bye bye.